Joining me again on the Neil Wilkins podcast is a return visit by entrepreneur, influencer, thought leader, and money guru, Rob Moore. Welcome back, Rob. Thanks, Neil. It's so good to see you again. And it's been, well, there's been so much happening since our last conversation. And we're going to go to this banned book in just a moment. But how has life been for you? There's there's chaos out there right now, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if we go back to March 2020, the world is almost unrecognizable. And that was probably the most disruptive, challenging and threatening event to my entire nearly two decade business history. And it did change everything. But as I look back, I would say there were many great lessons and gifts. And I think that is how life is, how life has been and how life will always be, which is uh, I have 32 challenges over here, which I won't bore you with, Neil, because that's not interesting to anyone. And I have 75 opportunities over here, which are a bit more exciting. So, you know, I have a show called Disruptors and I even have T-shirts with disruptive on them. So I can't complain when things are disruptive and chaotic because clearly I wouldn't write it on my T-shirt if I didn't want to be disruptive. I actually think right now where we sit, in the history of everything, there is just so much more opportunities. You can self-publish and launch your own book. You can start your own media channel on social media. You can start your own shop on, on e-commerce or you can sell secondhand stuff on Etsy or Depop. Your kids can uh, earn money. And it is the most exciting time to be alive. We're moving now into AI and that's changing everything again. And, you know, if you think about, just 200 years ago, the speed of travel was a horse. A, a hundred years before that, or however many, the speed of information was a, a bird. Literally, a bird would carry information. And now it's faster than the speed of light through potential quantum entanglement. So because of that, things change so much more rapidly. And that is exciting. But that also means that if you are slow, you are dead. Mm. Yeah. And I think this is that kind of that duality, isn't it? That for some people, and I, I just feel the passion again, coming through from you in terms of this uncertainty, this disruption, this chaos, in, which you thrive in. But other people, some other people don't, and they feel that's a real kind of threat. Do, do you see this kind of duality? It's almost like we've got this spectrum, but people don't tend to be in the middle. They're at kind of one end or the other. We've got to feel for people who, who are kind of like seeking to go back to what they might term normal, because there is no normal, is there? No, well, normal is what you make of your life or what you perceive others have made of their life. But in reality, we're all individual. So there is no normal. And what was, was. And what is, is. And what will be, will be, which means if you hold on to what was, well, you're getting left behind because what is, is different to what was. So, yeah, things are changing fast and some people are clinging on to the past through fear. And, you know, maybe they're worried about getting left behind or maybe they don't think they can reskill or, um, yeah, you know, maybe change makes them feel vulnerable. I understand all these emotions because I'm a human, therefore I feel them too, even though I've got two decades experience in business. But when you've been through some cycles, so for example, you know, a property crash scared me the first time it happened when I owned property. A property crash I now know is a great opportunity to buy higher yielding, higher net cash flowing assets, crypto was cheaper before it went in a bull run. Watches are cheaper. Classic cars are cheaper. Real estate is cheaper, you know, relatively. So I don't know, like inherently change slightly scares me, but very much excites me. And I'm told that fear and excitement are almost the same emotion. 
So as a little tip for anyone, Neil, who's clinging on to the past or searching for the normal, it would be to feel into the fear, understanding that that's really close to the, the potential of excitement. Let me give you an example. Let's say, you know, your career's coming to an end. You've had a 30-year career in middle management. And that's scary to think about going out on your own and starting as an entrepreneur, maybe in your 50s. But that's also really exciting because your financial future could change very quickly. You know, I'm really upset and angry with the governments and the central banks and the way that I believe that they've sort of ruined the countries and the economies for the masses. But that gives me opportunities to write Money Matrix and to teach millions of people to get better financial education and knowledge that I wouldn't have if the school system was really good and if the, the central banks and the governments managed money really well. So actually, that's a great opportunity for me, that destructive change. And that flip side, because there's a flip side, it's yin yang, it's black versus white, it's kind of, there is no grey, it's just, you know, it, yeah, th there's always that upside, that opportunity in the chaos, in the downside, you know, bull markets, bear markets, etc. Where did the, I mean, you've mentioned obviously Money Matrix, and we were always going to go there, because this is quite an interesting one, because this is a banned book, as far as your publisher was concerned. And that must have been an interesting experience. You know when you're disrupting when. How on earth did the, this kind of this resistance from a publisher come about? Were you kind of really rattling that cage just a little bit too much? Well, we'll see, Neil, um, because the book only came out a few days ago, though it is, you know, doing very well. So I'm with the second biggest publisher in the world. They're called Hachette, and they're a global publisher. And I have one of the biggest contracts they've ever done in the John Murray Learning Division, which is more sort of nonfiction. And I think I have a six book deal, which is rare. And we're on the last book. And I went a bit off script in my last maybe three books. I wrote a best selling book in the UK called Money, which has done very well. Money. No more, make more, give more. And then I started, I wrote a book called Start Now, Get Perfect Later. I wrote a book called I'm Worth More. And I started writing on all the areas of entrepreneurial and personal development success, you know, time management and taking action and building your routine in routine equals results and opportunity. And my publisher said, you know what, Rob, I think the subject of money is your specialist subject, which I agree with him on. And he said, you need to go back to your irreverent self. Irreverent. So I took it on board. I wrote Money Matrix. And then he said, Rob, it's too political. We can't publish it. So that's a bit ironic. So, yeah, they won't publish it. And so, like, I see that as an opportunity. I can get upset and get on my high horse and demand my publisher take me seriously as a, the artist that I am. Or I can go, no worries, I'll, I'll, I'll write you another one. And by the time you've got back to me on what my new one is, I'd have already published this one through my own publishing house, which I have right there. And that's exactly what I've done. He hasn't even responded to me yet since he said, I won't publish this. Let's do another one. I gave him seven ideas. He hasn't even responded. By that time, I've already published this one. And I'm selling a, a lot of them. So this is a great gift in many ways. But yeah, it's banned by, well, went banned. Yeah, banned. Like, won't publish it. And I'm more than okay with that because it tells me that it's a risky book. And I have the saying, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. So if I wrote a bland, hey, here's how to get better with money book. How to be good with money. It's just boring. No one's going to read How to Be Good with Money. But what about How to Beat the Banks at Their Own Game? Woo! That's a little bit more spicy. So I feel like the book is, it's got the irreverence and the disruption uh, and the rantiness that people see from me every day on my public speeches and on social media. And that's what maybe one or two of my other books have lacked. So I'm all in.
That's exciting times. And yeah, how to be the beat the banks at their own game. That I mean, obviously, you know, you've been doing this for some time and you know, clearly finance to use that sort of you know broader term is your thing. It's what we all think of you. Um at the, the core of kind of Rob Moore is just kind of what the value is that you bring. Why why is the system broken? Why is it so bad? And why is it not serving us? Because you would argue if you were kind of on that side of the fence that, well, no, we're here for everyone. This is the reason that we have a banking system. Why is it so bad? Why is it so broken? Yeah. So I probably have used the word a broken system for a while, but I might correct myself, Neil. The system isn't broken for the people who run the system. It's perfectly working fine for the globalists, for the central banks, for whoever controls government. It's working perfectly fine for them (laughs) because they're making trillions. It's not of the people and for the people. And so that's the element of what's broken, which you and I refer to often, Neil. Why is this the case? Because it's human nature. Human nature is to take and to consume and to grow and to overpower and to dominate. We've been having wars over land and territory for as long as we've been mobile and can move from tribe to tribe. All we have now is a really powerful tribe that control the entire land and population of the world. And that is whoever is running the global system. So I'm a a voice more for the people than, you know, the one world government or the money matrix, as I call it. So I can't really judge people becoming greedy and corrupt because that's what power does. And many people who currently aren't in that situation would become that if they're in that situation. And if I, had a, if I could buy a money printer and print my own money, Neil, well, of course I would. Even if it devalued money for others. Would I turn down a money printer that could print infinite amounts of money for me, knowing that it would erode the value of everyone else's money by a few small 0.something percentage points. No, I wouldn't. I'd sort of figure out that they wouldn't notice and I'd take the money printer anyway and I'd print trillions and then I'd do good with it. You know, because I have a selfish element to me, as does every human. Kidnap your children and let's see if you're going to be selfless. No, you're not. You're going to be selfish. So I've studied this a lot and I've thought about this from both sides. So here's the reality. If you transcend judgment and you look to learn how these systems work and you look to pick the best parts structurally of these systems and you implement it in your own life, You can beat the banks at their own game and win the game of money. Because any game of money is essentially monopoly. You create a product out of thin air. You create an offer out of thin air. You sell it to people who didn't even know existed yesterday. And you're essentially an alchemist. You are converting thought energy and inspiration in your mind being filtered through everything that you receive as information, you listen to music, you see art, you watch documentaries, you filter all that through into a sense of self, and then ideas percolate based on your filters and what you experience, and then you put that into a product that you create. That's alchemy. And then you've got to capitalize on it. Capitalize derives from the word capital, which is money. Well, actually, capital derives from the word head of a cow which had a financial value, a measurement of value. So I've been studying how the banks work for nearly two decades. They're very good at creating their own money system, controlling money supply. They're very good at creating product without people knowing that they're the product and making interest and leveraging debt 
and creating revenue streams through taxation and loans and making trillions out of it. They're good at using inflation to pay off their own debt. They're good at using money they didn't make or earn to earn on. Well, you can get good at all those things if you learn how to do it. And that's what Money Matrix is. Money Matrix is an expose of the system. Now, the reason it's controversial, and my publisher banned it, and this book could you know, be banned from the mainstream, is because the small amount of people who run and control the world have knowledge that others don't, and they want to keep it secret because if everyone knew about it, Everyone could do it. That's why it's not in the school system. That's why you're not educated on it, because there's a secret that only a small number of people know on how to get really rich. And if everyone knew it, their secret would be out and they wouldn't be really rich because everyone else would know how to get rich. And people like me who feel like I want to teach the world this because I, I think it's your right. I believe it is your divine birthright to gain access to information that is useful to you as a human to be productive and learning how to be an entrepreneur and how to make money. You know, this is useful information that can make you productive, that can make you valuable, that can help you produce for your community and also earn handsomely from it. But of course, not everyone's like me where I teach what I know because I don't have a scarcity mindset. And I know that I could teach a billion people and I'll still be rich. Whereas the banks that rule the world, they need it to stay core. They need just a few of them controlling everything. A few big media companies, a few big corporations, you know, one world government, new world order, a few major banks controlling all the money. And that's my book. The second half of the book, there's 300 and odd pages. 200 of them are how to beat the banks at their own game, how to make, manage, multiply, and maintain money, how to get your tax bill down, how to get your income streams up, how to build multiple streams of recurring income, how to be a producer rather than the consumer. And I have transcended the moral judgment that it's good or bad. I just know it's my life's mission. Mm, that was where I wanted to go with my next question. That There's this idea of philanthropy which is really what you're doing here because you are providing based on your higher purpose here you're providing value to those who you believe need it challenging the system which isn't serving those same people is there still a place within this let's call it the new money matrix or rob's money matrix to kind of coin a phrase is there still a place for capitalism in the way that we know it and have learned it through textbooks and years and years of experience is there still to make a, and create and develop a product or service and then to, to in effect sell it to make money is that still part of the game going forward so create a product sell it make money absolutely is one of the best ways to make money but we have no such thing as capitalism. That doesn't exist anymore. Not in, you see, supposed to be, isn't it, that the West is the capitalist state, states. But really what we have in the UK is at best socialism and at worst communism. Like if everything you make and you spend, 70% of it is taxed. That's saying you're working 70% of the time for the state and 30% of the time for you. That sounds to me like socialism or communism, just because it's not labeled as such. So we don't really have capitalism. Personally, and I'm biased because I am entrepreneurial, I believe that capitalism, free markets, fair competition with relatively low intervention from government other than antitrust and monopoly control so that there is free markets and fair competition. Um, I believe that that is the best system for building wealth from nothing and having no ceiling on your wealth. Yeah, I, but it doesn't exist. So you have to create your own capitalism. You have to create your own economy. In my book, Money, I wrote about you economy and your GDP. 
So the economy will say, well, this is the economy. And it grew by 0.1% this year or this quarter or this period. Oh, and actually, it's a recession now because in the last three quarters, we've gone down by negative 0 point something percent. But these are just average statistics like average height and average weight and average whatever. But you should be much more interested in your economy than the economy because you can create your economy in a downward economy or a recession. So you GDP is how much money you create and flow. And when I say create, through alchemy, through idea into in to income. So if you focus on those and not the, the wider macros of what's going on in the world, you can exercise the, the concept of the free market and the ability without restriction to create your own product or service and sell it and be useful and produce and scale and have a fair share of the profits. This is possible. But you need to go to locations that have lower tax. You need to go to locations which are more entrepreneur and productivity friendly. You need to leverage the internet and social media. You need to have a, a company structure that gives you offsetables and tax breaks and write-offs. And you need to take care of all of this yourself because... The current system in the UK and many states in America and much of the West is not capitalist anymore, even if it calls itself that. Mm. Feels like there's a, a, a real need to wake up. Is it, it feels like this is a rallying call within your book to, to really wake up, really kind of understand the system. Obviously, the book helps um, uh, us all to do that, but then to be really proactive. I know you, you talked a lot in our previous conversation about multiple streams of income. That was a key, key message that came through. And I think anybody who's here as an entrepreneur, business owner, um, you might have a side hustle looking to, you know, really take that to market. You know, that's, that's one kind of part of the audience here. Others are here representing brands and other people's products and services and working maybe as marketers for those other people. It still feels, though, that whichever side of the fence you're on, whichever kind of role that you have, this is about waking up and being proactive because it almost feels there's an inherent need to have multiple streams of income. It's almost like you get wrapped into, if you've just got one trick pony, you're a one trick pony. And if you've only got that one option, you then get caught by the system. Do, do multiple streams of income allow you to almost sort of dance with the system so that you can actually ultimately win? Yeah, well, ultimately what money is, is freedom. You can go where you want with money. You can go when you want with money. You can go with whom you want with money. You can do what you want with money. The more money you have, the more access to the who, the what, the where and the when. Without money, the less access. Let's say you're struggling and you want to go on holiday. Well, you got to wait six months to take the time off work and you've got to save 50 pounds a month on the end of your salary. It's going to take you years. Whereas if you have free time and you have the money, you can go tomorrow. So money is freedom. The banks know this because they control the money. Therefore, they have the freedom. But they use you as the product to reduce your money, to reduce your freedom. So that's what money is. So this is why I believe that making money is not just a luxury, but a necessity. Multiple streams of income used to be a luxury. Now it's a necessity. Recurring and passive income used to be a luxury. Now it's a necessity. You know, you used to be able to buy a house and pay off a mortgage on one income in the household. Now most households need two income streams just to pay the mortgage, not to feed the family, to just to pay the mortgage. So, yeah, a lot of people are looking for side hustles. And it, like convert, this is bad, Neil, that, you know, it takes two household incomes, not one, to pay the average mortgage. And the cost, you know, the, the soaring relative cost of a house and the relative amount of your income a house takes and living takes. But 
conversely, the opportunity to start a business on social media, editing content, e-commerce, information, your own membership site, it's easier than it's ever been because anyone can just go and join Facebook. Well, you probably joined it 15 years ago. Anyone can put content on TikTok. Anyone can go on Depop or Vinted or eBay or Etsy or Amazon and sell stuff. Anyone. So we've got this paradox whereby living conditions relatively in terms of your spending power are the worst since the Second World War. But opportunities to create more income streams, diverse, global, literally just from having a phone or a laptop, are better than they've ever been. It's interesting that then. It's kind of then why is nobody getting it? I mean, obviously they had to wait for your book, Money Matrix, but why haven't people just kind of realized this? There seems this really odd sort of void where people have just become either blinded by something else or just very, very passive to the system. Yeah, so it depends on who you're talking about because hundreds of thousands of people in my community they are aware of this. They're reading my books. They're on all my social media. They're coming to my events. They're following entrepreneur creators and they're well aware of this and they're making life-changing money in the quickest time I've ever seen. But the masses aren't aware of this because of fear, media, propaganda, doom-mongering, and ultimately the system. There are still remnants of you being able to offset a lot of expenses and get your tax bill down as an entrepreneur and start your own business and make really good, healthy money. There are still remnants of that. And we go through cycles where countries encourage entrepreneurship and innovation. They pull in a load of overseas money because they have tax breaks for overseas people and they have tax breaks and incentives um, and, and, you know, support schemes to start and scale your own business. They, they shut all that down. They sent all the Russian money away. They're pushing a lot of the Eastern money away. Um, they've closed a lot of the tax breaks because they're in survival mode because the only way the government in this country, the UK, know how to make money is by taking it off the masses. It's the only way they know. Ironically, if they reduced our tax a bit, but encourage us, encouraged us to create and make and innovate and build and produce, they're going to make a lot more money. Because if a tax was a flat rate of 20, no one would be avoiding any. So if Corp is, if that is 20 and Corp is 25 and income is 45 and national insurance is 12, every entrepreneur I know is going to do their absolute best to avoid that, of course, legally and sometimes not because people do try and do it illegally when it's too much. And so the government aren't really going to get a huge amount of this money that they're taxing us on. If it was a flat 20, then 95% of entrepreneurs would pay it. So they'd probably generate a lot more money. And they would dramatically increase the GDP and the economy because there'd be more production and more creativity and more innovation and more jobs and less unemployment and everything else. So, but the government are essentially a, a self-appointed, legally trading, insolvent company. So, if I knowingly take money, i.e. trade, sell products, knowing that I'm losing money, that is called trading insolvently, and I can either be struck off as a director, or even I could, that could be a criminal, not just civil offence. But the government allowed themselves to do that legally because they're trillions in debt and they never balance the books. They never pay off the debt. So they got this uncreative, all-consuming, punishing, socialist stroke, communist society. And they're trying to sort of pretend that it's not. I mean, I don't know if you saw the budget. The, the masters of spin for how amazing the government is for saving us 2p on national insurance, even though they have to generate 9 billion in extra revenue 
And if their only revenue source is increased tax or reduced spending from us, then we're all being penalised for 2%, sorry, a two pence saving on national insurance. It's a mockery, a mockery. But here's what will happen, Neil, because this is cycles. In the end, all the entrepreneurs will bugger off to Portugal, bugger off to Dubai. There'll be no one left in the country to build and produce. We don't have any assets left. We don't produce or building anything anymore. We sold it all off. So all the main revenue generators for the country will have left. And they'll be like, shit, we can't put taxes up anymore. We haven't got the billionaires here. They've all buggered off. Fuck, we better try and lure them all back. OK, so the, the first way they'll do it, by the way, is completely wrong. But what they'll do is go, oh, you can't be non-dom, you can't leave. And they'll try and threaten us to stay. And that won't work. And so in the end, they'll have to go, we want to make this country the hub of entrepreneurship. Come back to us, move to us, set up a bit. And, you know, it just goes in cycles. We're just at the, we're just at the worst end of it right now. That being said, anyone can start a business online. Anyone can monetize TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and all the other social media channels. Anyone can be a creator. Anyone can set up a membership site. Anyone can sell product or service globally from their living room on their laptop. So the reason most people don't know this is ultimately the governments and central banks controlling the information and suppressing the information. Because essentially, who, who controls the world? Controls media. Controls money. And controls government. Uh, and they're the three main vehicles. Policy, information, and money. They're the three main controllable elements to control the masses. Well, also health. But I'm not even going to go there because this content will definitely get banned if we start talking about vaccines and pharmaceuticals. <laughs> so, end of paragraph. <laughs> That's so beautifully put, Rob. So do you feel that then there's there's an opportunity here for us to kind of take money out of the equation? Because from listening to the story here, if we're sort of looped into this cycle, um, which is not serving any of us, well, serving the few, um, some of us, the more entrepreneurial types are still being very successful by the way that we're defining it, despite all of this, because of attitude, because of proactivity, because they've figured out to play the system. Do, do we feel that we might get to a point where if we were to take money out of the equation, and this would be a really controversial one, wouldn't it? Because what would the system then be without it? But if we were trading on value, if we were trading on you know, for example, here, you know, I'm advocating your book, you're coming on and give me some incredible content. No money's changed hands. And yet we've traded value. Do you feel we could get to a point where it goes beyond the money, it goes beyond the taxation, it goes beyond the system, and all we become as a society then is a trading of value? Because that would get interesting. The problem with a trade of value without money is it's inefficient. So how do we measure the fair exchange of value? Here, it's easy. I give value to your audience. You give me your audience. But if we were to create a currency that measures interviewee versus host, I value me, you value you. But my value might be unequal to yours. So how do we create universal value? Money. Money universalifies my, uh, value, i.e. my latent value is X, your latent value is Y, and we measure it universally with this thing we call money. So to remove money creates the inconsistency of value per perception which is essentially what barter was. Now, money loves speed and hates friction. So money will always evolve to its highest level of speed and its lowest level of friction, which is why now we have money evolving into digital currencies, central bank currencies or decentralized currencies like crypto. They're, they're even more, they're even faster and lower friction than cash digital exchange. So 
it's unlikely that we'll ever revert back. Now, there are some societies that are looking to go back to something akin to barter and remove money. And sometimes evolution is actually de-evolution. But in a way, that's a utopia that's a bit naive. In reality, if you want, because here's the thing as well, Neil, to add to this. If money is freedom, control of money is control. So the opposite of freedom is being controlled. And the central banks and governments use media and policy and money to control. If the government, if the system can get you into debt, it's going to earn interest from you. It's going to control how and where you spend your money. It's going to take your money first. It's going to keep you dependent. So why would the system want the removal of money when money for them is control and decentralized money for you is freedom? So a lot of people who love Bitcoin, they actually love freedom. Because to be able to have a decentralized currency, which might avoid taxation, which might avoid government control and policy, which might avoid inflation, that's freedom to the masses and it's a lack of control for central banks and governments. And that's why you see very communist countries banning it. So the system loves money because it uses money to control you. You need to love money and get really good at making money so you can control your own life and you can have freedom. And so it's not about moving away from money. It's about making more of it in the current and the future form. Bitcoin's on a bull run. Crypto's on a bull run. I'm not, in, I'm not advising to invest in it, but if you can trade up some of these bull runs, if you can create your own NFTs, if you can have real estate in the metaverse and own your own domain names and own your own subscription platforms and own your own assets and some of them decentralized and you can have multiple streams of income and you can manage your tax bill down and increase your income streams and increase your value. And if you can write books and create content and have millions of followers and or have not millions of followers, but hack virality, that's how you beat the system. Mm. We need to get this book, Rob, don't we, into everybody's hands. How best to go about that? Obviously, I'll share in the uh, the notes below everybody. You can find uh, all Rob's socials and uh, his various uh, sort of initiatives, if we could call those um, th that word. But how do they actually get a hold of a copy of the book? Yeah, so if you go to moneymatrix.cash, you can see there, and this might have finished, just letting you know, but we have a very special offer to buy the book and get some special book launch bonuses, including possibly a lunch and a dinner with me, um, like a fairly private, intimate money mindset session, special tickets to a new three-day Money Maker Summit. Now, they may have expired, just because obviously it depends when you go live with this, but to possibly claim all of that, go to moneymatrix.cash. If they've expired, you can obviously just get the book on Amazon. Brilliant. Rob, it's always an absolute pleasure to hear your wisdom and uh, disruptive ideas. And uh, I wish you every success with the book. The world needs to hear it. So thank you again. Thank you, Neil.